Hello, uh, everyone. We'll give it a second, as I know the uh, beginning of these webinars takes a little bit for all the participants to come into the channel. Um, my name is Matthew Eby, and I'm the CEO here at First Street. And with me is uh, Dr. Jeremy Porter, our head of climate implications research, uh, and Dr. Ed Kearns, our chief science officer at uh, First Street Foundation. So. Thank you everyone for taking the time to, to join and learn about our new air quality model. Uh, and so I'll run through just a, a few housekeeping items here at the beginning. Uh, and then uh, I will pass it over to uh, uh, Dr. Porter and Dr. Kearns to run through the slides. And then I'll come back at the end uh, and show you uh, how this all, all kind of manifests through our product risk factor um, to allow individuals access to it outside of just the normal access that we provide to, to our other customers. Um, so to get, to get started, um, we always encourage participation. So please, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat uh, and we will be able to answer those as we go through. Unfortunately, we probably will not get to every question as we generally have thousands of people join these, uh, these webinars and this is no exception. So please drop in your questions. We'll do the best we can to answer them. The webinar is being recorded. We'll also send that out after as a follow-up email as we always do. Uh, and uh, that is kind of, kind of it for the general housekeeping. So without further ado, I will pass this over to, uh, to Jeremy to get us kicked off with the findings of, of what the team's created in the model uh, details overall. Great, thanks, Matt. Uh, so I, I'll, as Matt mentioned, I'll walk through uh, this slide deck, which really focuses on the report that we released uh, this past Monday uh, in combination with the new Air Factor uh, uh, component of, of riskfactor.com. So we're really highlighting here the research behind the model development, some of the context around uh, recent trends in air quality uh, and in really air quality improvement for the most part, but, but sort of what we're looking forward to uh, uh, in the future with the impact of climate on, on that air quality. And then, and then Ed, Dr. Kearns is here also with us and he'll walk through the actually the actual modeling and the science behind the model. So I'll, I'll sort of step through this, um, in, in terms of the actual analysis we're we're really focused on the air quality index. And, uh, a lot of us here on the on the East Coast and in the Midwest became really familiar with the air quality index in the last uh, half year and last summer when the Canadian wildfires brought a lot of smoke uh, into the area. And all of a sudden we saw the AQI on the news channels. And it was part of kind of our daily routine for a couple of weeks there. Uh, people on the West Coast have been using this scale for a long time. It's a scale that's been put out uh, as a way of really measuring the impact that, that air quality has on, on health more than anything else, but also it's been used to sort of gauge the ability of, in, of individuals to engage in uh, outdoor labor and for, for people to engage in recreational activities or, or, or even go to school sometimes for kids. So we're using these thresholds uh, for the different uh, pollutants to understand uh, a, a projection of today in regard to how many days we expect to cross these thresholds and then projecting that out into the future. And so together, uh, one thing to understand in regard to that uh, projection is that we're, we're really focused on the way in which people interact with the air quality index. And the way in which people interact with it is that, you know, if the air quality index gets over 300 in a specific day, people see that, they feel that, they're, they're, they're in their home. There are different metrics associated with the, the use of the, the air quality uh, index and sort of the persistence associated with how long people are exposed to these metrics, but we're using the hourly data uh, from the EPA as a way of understanding if we cross th these thresholds throughout the day historically, and then integrating our, our climate components, which Ed will talk through a little bit later to understand our expectations of crossing these thresholds today and then out into the future. Uh, so just to start off, uh, air quality has improved dramatically uh, since the middle of the last century. In, in 1955, the Air Pollution Control Act was enacted. Uh, following that, we saw the Clean Air Act. There's been a handful of amendments that have been passed in regard to the Clean Air Act. 
the national ambient air quality standards being being a really important component of that. Also, the the development and and uh, uh, creation of the EPA uh, uh, as part of this 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 suite of of uh, federal regulatory or, or or sort of regulation around our ability to control and understand air pollution, and ultimately over this this time period up through the 1990s here, we're actually showing in this graph that along with the implementation of these different regulatory policies, we really decreased uh, pollution in the air and, and, and improved air quality across the country. Uh, of course, the, this only takes us up in this graph up to about 1990. Uh, we didn't actually start measuring some of the different air quality components that we're focused on today, like PM 2.5 until later around 2000, we actually started measuring uh, PM 2.5 levels. So we're gonna end up using that data uh, from the EPA, but really to set the context around the rest of this analysis, the, the the primary point that we're trying to make here is that you know air quality has improved dramatically, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that we took action in the form of federal regulatory policies uh, to improve air quality and reduce pollutants, primarily from things like automobile emissions and industry and factories, uh, different ways in which we 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 could actually control. Uh, the origins or the, the the sources of those pollutants. If we step into uh, a more recent history and start to focus on some of the metrics that we're going to cover in this analysis, uh, we 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 really are geared towards two two different primary uh, pollutants, or what the EPA refers to as their criteria pollutants. There are two of those that have been shown to be connected to changes in the climate over recent years. One of those is PM 2.5, and we'll talk a little bit about the sources of that and some of the trends we're seeing there, but also ozone. Ozone's another criteria pollutant that has been shown to be connected to some of the changes that we're seeing in, in meteorological and cl climatological inputs. Uh, and both of those, we're starting to see trends in which there are reversals associated with the improvements that we've made uh, in, in air quality improvements over the time period. So the, the graph that you see in front of you is, is PM2.5 2, 2 concentrations. Uh, from those, those PM2.5 concentrations, you can actually see that as we started to measure it in 2000 through about 2016, and then, again, these are national level uh, 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 hourly metrics across the entire country. Here, we're taking the average metric on a specific day from that hourly time series. And then we're fitting a low S line to this model to, to essentially understand uh, what the trend has looked like over time. You can actually see from 2000 to about 2016, regulatory policies continue to improve pollution across the country. Uh, but since about 2016, 2015, 2016 time period, we've seen an inflection point. We've actually started to see an increase uh, in, in average PM25 levels across the entire country. Uh, uh, again, we know that air quality is uh, better in some parts of the country, worse in other parts of the country. Uh, it's interesting that at a national level, we're starting to see uh, this inflection point or what the literature oftentimes refers to as the climate penalty. So this climate penalty really indicates that we, we've improved air quality from regulatory policies. Climate is now starting to reverse some of those gains that we made over that, that, that time period since the middle of the last half century. Uh, if we if we switch the metric from actually looking at mean levels of of PM25 from the hourly data and actually look at the maximum level that we that, that we that we extract from the time series, we can actually see there's a much more consistent pattern associated with the increasing pollution in the air and the decreasing quality of of of, of air. Uh, so if you look at at this this graph in particular, you can see over on the on the left hand side we've converted. The, uh, the micrograms per meter squared to the AQI index threshold. But if you look on the right-hand side at the chart, we've actually carried through those different AQI indice colors across the uh, hourly data that you can see in the background. And you can actually see the maximum metric in 2000 on average was unhealthy for sensitive groups, but that's changed to being unhealthy for all groups. So we're actually seeing that in the worst case scenarios, or if we focus on the maximum metric, on average across the country, we're seeing the most extreme air quality days or the worst of the worst air quality days have gotten consistently worse over this time period. So on average, there's this, this climate penalty and increasing 
uh, 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 amount of pollution in the air that we're just starting to see. But if you look at the maximums, there's been this, this consistent increase in the poor air quality base. Um, so if we focus on just the regional uh, variation in the in in these in these air quality days, you can actually see that the west is kind of driving that climate penalty that we've been looking at. So this again is just PM 2.5 concentration uh, across across the four different regions. You can see the uh, the yearly data in the background, and then we have a fit line to that yearly data. The inflection point on the climate penalty for the west actually looks like it comes into play closer to about 2009. 2010 in this graph. So we saw it earlier in the national graph about 2016 that was weighted by the Midwest, the South and the Northeast, uh, not really seeing this inflection point occur yet. But in the West, we, we've already seen this for about a decade and a half now, uh, where air quality is consistently and persistently getting worse over time. You can you can also start to see that in the South, there, there's beginning to be an upward trend and in, in, it's associated with some of our other models. Again, uh, Dr. Kearns will talk through this in a little little while, but in the South and especially in the Southeast, we're we're starting to see increasing intensities uh, and and frequencies of wildfires in the area. And those those increasing frequencies of of wildfires then are associated with the mass emitted from those wildfires and the smoke in the area. Again, it's overall negative. The Midwest and the Northeast again are are still overall negative. Uh, really, what we're trying to pull out of this graph is to highlight the fact that. There are regional variations, and in the West, not only has it been the area with the with the uh, poorest air quality uh, uh, in, in recent history, but it's really driving that climate penalty that we've identified earlier. Uh, and you can't uh, disentangle this from the the wildfire activity. So if we focus just in the western area uh, of the country and we look at the maximum levels of uh, uh, of uh, air emissions per the air quality index values, you can actually see the maroon value here, three, 300, just gets dwarfed by some of these uh, levels of, of emissions and concentrations in the air from these big wildfires. So all of these are uh, newspaper uh, uh, titles that we pulled out uh, associated with the big wildfires, and you can actually see how they correlate very well with these spikes and PM25. So we're not actually uh, seeing Air quality or air, poor air quality increases from things like ozone or or other pollutants, even anthropogenic pollutants, on the order of what we're starting to see already from these big wildfires and the mass emitted from these big wildfires in the form of wildfire smoke and and PM two five. Uh, what does this mean in terms of our experience of the of the poor air quality uh, and, and poor air quality days? in particular. So if you go back and you look just in the West, so this is just the West region of the country per the US Census Bureau, we looked at the, the, the number of orange days, red days, purple days, and maroon days over time. It ended up being a little bit trickier than we, than we thought at first because over this same time period, the EPA has consistently added more and more stations to the network. So that, that of course means that you're, you're, uh, you're automatically gonna start to count more orange days, red days, purple days, maroon days. So what we did is we set those days as a ratio to the number of stations that exist. And then we looked at how that ratio has changed from 2000 to 2020. And when you do that, you can actually see there's been an increase in poor air quality days across all of our poor air quality day categories. So orange days were already the highest and they, they've increased uh, uh, over this time period, but the worst of the air quality days, maroon days, we see are increasing by almost two times what they were in the year 2000. So uh, all of the poor air quality days are increasing, but maroon days are increasing the fastest. Jeremy, we had a question that I think is relevant to what you were just talking about. So I thought I'd come in and just ask you live on it, but. One of the things I know you actually went through it just and you were talking about it just now is the increase in stations, obviously, as air quality became more and more of something that the government was interested in and we were all interested in as a, a population, we put more and more sensors in place. Do you have a, an estimate or a sense of how many sensors there actually are now? Because obviously you talked about at the beginning as well, we didn't even have sensors to measure PM25, particularly at the beginning when we were looking at air quality as a, a topic as a country, as it started to then, the, air, the, the new uh, Air Quality Act started to go into place. So 
you have any any idea now um, on on what we're at from a sensor network and how that's grown over time? I, I, I may, and Ed may hate me for this, but I may defer to him when he gets to the actual method section. When we went and we looked at the stations, it's on the EPA uh, website where you download the data. It actually tells you there the number of stations that are in each of the yearly counts. I I I, I, I hesitate to throw out the number. I want to say something like forty thousand or something stations are are in the PM network, but that's probably that's on in my head. That, that could be wrong. We can confirm that. And during Q and A, I can look that up real quick and and respond with that with that answer and really how much we've improved or, or increased uh, in terms of the number of stations over time. So it is it is tracked. It became something that we had to kind of think through in our model because as we went back to 2000, there were many, many fewer stations over this time period. As you started to increase, there, there are oftentimes reasons why stations get put into places. In some cases, because there's poor air quality in, in those areas. And other times it's because we need to fill in the network or the spatial network associated with these uh, uh, station sensors. The EPA also produces a, a gridded data set called CMAC, which does estimate the concentrations of different pollutants between stations. So there are ways in which we can estimate areas that we don't actually have uh, that kind of information. But the, the station network has grown dramatically over this, this in, our, in our data set, about 22 year uh, uh, time period. And we can, we can peg the actual number uh, on that uh, as we get into the Q&A. Um, and so if we if we continue to focus in, California is really a hot spot for a lot of these poor air quality days. You'll see it as we get into the tables. But as we, we were really digging in, we, we, we started to focus in on California. And as we did that, we, we were looking at, at the station network that just lies within the boundaries of, of California. So here you can see uh, in the graph the number of days per year on the y-axis and then the year on the, on the x-axis. The number of days uh, per year essentially amount to the number of days of, uh, of the, the, the threshold in the AQI category that we're interested in. So here in, in 2001, a really uh, uh, a relatively quiet wildfire year, uh, not much in the way of, of, um, of poor air quality days in the data. But as you started to move across from 2001 to 20, uh, 2021, you can see that we're starting to normalize some of these poor air quality days, especially if you think about orange, red, purple, and maroon days as, as sort of an umbrella term for poor air quality. Now we're getting to the point to, you know, uh, we're, we're getting about 250 or so days a year that are either green or yellow. Uh, and then the rest of the year, you know, over 100, 115 uh, or so days now are either orange days, red days, purple days, or maroon days. And if you're you're starting to now uh, get to the point where about a third of the year is starting to be what we would refer to as poor air quality days in our report, it's really becoming something that people in the West and especially in California in this analysis are, are really starting to normalize. They're starting to expect these poor air quality days. They're starting to get comfortable with living by the AQI uh, index and a lot of the health concerns, the economic concerns, the quality of life concerns that come along with that. Uh, at the bottom of the graph, uh, you can kind of see that it, it really is a zero sum metric because we're dealing with the 365 days as we're increasing in orange days and red days and purple days and in maroon days, we're necessarily decreasing in green days and yellow days. So we're, we're, we're starting to trade some of our good air quality days for poor air quality days. And while there there is, as you can see in the graph, you can see in all of the graphs that we looked at, up to this point, this interannual variability where some years it's good, some years it's poor, uh, we're starting to see an overall trend where the the, the good air quality days are starting uh, uh, to be replaced by poor air quality days, at least in this metric. And again, just for, for context, uh, you can see the, the, the title on this graph. These are the number of max PM25 days across the CA, the California Station Network which means that at least one station hit this threshold on this given day. So we're starting to see these trends. There are always pockets of poor air quality and good air quality on any given day, but it gives us the ability to start to understand that this is becoming uh, a more frequent event. 
and I'll I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Kearns now, who who uh, will walk through the science behind the development of the the air quality model. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, yes, and so we had to create this these models uh, in order to, as Jeremy was talking about, how do we project what the expected changes are due to climate change across the entire nation, given the complexities associated with uh, observing air quality. So the number of, of stations, I mean, there was a question about how many there are, they're growing every day. The number of coming in is, the, the, you know, the observing network has really changed over the last couple of decades in a very positive way. Uh, so we have a much clearer picture of what air quality is across the US right now, but it's still not adequate. It, we still need more observations of this. Uh, and the CMAC model uh, that EPA runs that Jeremy just mentioned uh, was a big part of this study. So. Um, you, you know, to explain how, how we approach this, we looked at those components that have a clear climate signal. And those two components are ozone and particular matter PM 2.5. Uh, those are the two things that have some driver in them that is causing their concentrations to change over time, directly caused by climate change or indirectly caused by climate change. So those are the two that we'll focus on. Uh, next, please, Jeremy. So looking at the PM 2.5 first, uh, the impact from 2.5 from, uh, from on climate change comes from its impact on wildfire. And it's mainly that, uh, and we, we know this from our, the studies that we've done uh, with our partners from the Partridge Consortium and the, and the, and the Fire Factor product that, uh, that we published uh, about two years ago. When we put this information out there, what we're looking at is how is climate change impacting wildfire fuels and how are wildfires changing over the next couple of decades. And the main the main upshot of this research is that that greater air temperatures and lower humidities are causing the fuels, uh, the, the wildfire fuels, this is the vegetation across the country to be more combustible. And so we're seeing more and expecting to see more wildfires, not necessarily that they're going to be larger, more intense, but there's going to be more of them. And if there's more wildfires, there's going to be more wildfire emissions and the amount of PM 2.5 in the atmosphere is going to increase. Uh, so uh, so we in, in order to address this, we have to look at not just the wildfires, but also the wildfire contributions to PM 2.5, but also what is the background information uh, about PM 2.5 concentration? Because there are other sources as well, anthropogenic sources, as, as, as uh, Jeremy was describing. Uh, and so we, we leaned on uh, work from Marissa Childs and her collaborators that did some excellent work that they published about two years ago. And they very graciously allowed us to use their data where they were combining satellite data with the ground observations to come up with estimates of what the PM 2.5 concentrations are across the country. So we, we used that and leaned on, on that information. And then we used our the results from our wildfire modeling uh, to scale up to see, well, in, in 2024, how, how, what's the likely emissions of uh, from wildfires across the U.S.? Look out to 2054, uh, considering the climate models, the CMIP-6 climate models, with those changes in, in uh, temperature and humidity and the changes that they're going to have on wildfire behavior in the future. How, what's, the, what's the scale of the emissions going between the, the, the uh, 2054 period and 2024 period? And we use that to estimate what the additional contribution from wildfires across across the US is going to be. So this allows us to project out to 2054 what PM 2.5 concentrations are likely to be across the US. Uh, next, please. For ozone, it's a more direct contribution. Uh, so ozone production happens in the atmosphere when uh, when sunlight and uh, interacts with with precursor chemicals that are produced uh, in various ways. Uh, some are you know, from anthropogenic sources, some are natural, but uh, with, with light and heat and uh, water vapor, ozone is created in the atmosphere. Um, as heat is going to be increasing with increasing air temperature uh, from climate change and uh, humidity and basically something that we call the vapor pressure deficit, which is the difference between how much uh, water is in the air and how much uh, water the uh, air could hold, with those two parameters, we can project out into the future uh, how uh, ozone is ozone production is likely to be changing with climate change. So we leaned in this in this case we learned leaned on the EPA CMAC uh, model data that we just mentioned uh, briefly before. So this is an operational model that uh, EPA runs that predicts uh, estimates 
uh, concentrations of ozone uh, and other constituents across the, U the U.S. Uh, of course, we're focused on ozone in this case. We take that uh, and then we, we look at the projections of, of air temperature and humidity from the, um, uh, from the CMIP-6 climate models again. And then with a machine learning model and extreme value theory, we, we try to predict what are the, what's the likelihood of, of ozone uh, production going into the future. Uh, and from those, we can, again, project what the likely uh, ozone contributions are across the U.S. Uh, next, please. Great. And I just wanted to point out also that, that all of these models, the combined model that, that, that Ed walked through a couple of slides ago, the wildfire to smoke emissions, model and and the the ozone model all are are built upon this foundational peer-reviewed research so in, in each of these slides you'll see that we actually have a paper that's been published on the different topic that that, that vets the scientific processes so, and, and the results that follow are all built off of that those scientific uh, papers all right i actually clicked clicked here let me go to the next slide um, so as we're as we're projecting forward uh, into the future using the foundational models that that Dr. Kearns just walked through, we project all of our models out to 2054. As we're projecting those models uh, out to 2054, similar to the same thing that we've done with our, our flood factor, our fire factor, our wind factor, and our heat factor, we're really looking at how how these these trends that we've been focused on uh, 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 today and even historically are going to look into the future. And for this pattern is particularly interesting because we're seeing this climate penalty. And as we start to see this climate penalty and the inflection point that we started to see about the middle of the last decade, we wonder, is that going to continue uh, moving into the future? Uh, Dr. Kearns walked through some of the methods associated with uh, the wildfire model, the way in which we think about the change factor moving into the future. Again, all of our, our change factors for, uh, for the, the, the smoke emissions from the wildfire models are based on the, the physics that underlie the wildfire models that is our our fire factor and and, and the first tree wildfire uh, uh, model itself. So the emissions that come from those are simply a variable that we can run from the actual models that we're producing. And then we estimate a change factor based on that. So this shows that uh, moving out to about 2054, you can see 2054 kind of called out here on the on the on the x-axis of the graph. We expect to see about an 8% uh, increase in P2, PM25 from wildfires specifically. So if we project that out from uh, the, the end of the time series or kind of our point of departure here at the end of the time series, we can actually see with this horizontal line that we're going to be at a level of air quality that we were at in about 2004. So essentially over the next 30 years, we're going to be wiping away about 20 years of progress that we made associated with reducing pollutants in the air and increasing uh, air quality. But it also gives us the ability to think about uh, what air quality is going to look like into the future and then start to localize that. So we can tell people at their individual properties, we can tell people uh, about their, their communities, what it's going to look like in the future and what you can expect in regard to an estimate uh, in, in association with poor air quality uh, moving forward. Uh, across the country, we 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 created these metrics. We have them down to the property level. As you know, that's probably too high of a resolution associated with air quality. Usually, there 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 are uh, there is the opportunity for the to, for there to be kind of neighborhood to neighborhood variation. But for the most part, when you look at this map, there's really regional variation associated with these air quality metrics. Where and, and as we start to dig into the tables, you'll start to see that some of the counties really stand out in regard to the amount of uh, poor air quality days that they can expect to see today and into the future. So this map that we're looking at actually shows you uh, places that could see up to in our top category, that darkest category, 21 plus days of poor air quality from a combined model that's both the ozone model and the wildfire, the smoke model from, from the wildfire model that Dr. Kearns walked through. So as you, as you look at this, it really is a Western story. I mean, it, just given today's expectations, any of these areas in California, uh, on in the Western half of Oregon, uh, the Northern portions of, of Washington, much of Idaho, moving into Montana, portions of Wyoming and Colorado. And then and there's an interesting area 
uh, in South Georgia, kind of North Florida, right on the state line there, where we've seen increasing uh, frequency of wildfires, where all of these areas are expected to see upwards of 20, 21 days or more uh, poor air quality days. Uh, in, in the worst case scenario, uh, on the next page, I'll kind of highlight how high that gets. But really what this means for people in these areas, in these really dark counties, is that these areas are expected to see at least three weeks worth of poor air quality days in the current environment. So that would be for, t for this year in 2024, given recent historic trends, uh, these areas could see as many as, as three weeks worth of, of poor air quality days, uh, either orange or higher. Uh, and in terms of those orange plus days, the places that pop out is having the the, the most uh, uh, sort of severe exposure to these poor air quality days are really in the Central Valley of California, a lot of other areas in California, but Tulare County, Fresno County kind of stand out here as areas that that have almost three months worth of poor air quality days today in uh, the 2024 environment. Again, we know there's interannual variability. We know there will be good years and bad years, but what this means is that if it's a good year, these counties are gonna see less than that. If it's a bad year, Fresno and Tulare County can see more than the, the numbers that we have here. So more than three months worth of poor air quality days. I also wanna point out that uh, we're really focused on here on just counties that have 100,000 properties or more. So there are some places in that area that uh, aren't quite as populated. There's not quite as much in the way of population exposed to, to this, this climate hazard uh, that have even more days than, than we're showing here. But these are areas that, that, that are population centers, uh, areas that have a lot of economic activity, have a lot of recreational activities, uh, and have a large amount of population with uh, the potential for for persistent exposure and the health consequences that come along with that. Uh, you can also see places like Los Angeles, San Bernardino, uh, Riverside. So there are a lot of other places here that are very familiar to people that even outside of the region as really large population areas that that have this high level of exposure. If if we project this out uh, into the future, uh, we can see again it's a national story. Uh, really what we're seeing in the Midwest area, uh, around the Great Lakes, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, kind of Northern Kentucky, on over into, into the Northeast Mid-Atlantic region uh, is really driven by increases in ozone exposure. So that the increases in these areas are somewhere on the order of three to five to seven days. Uh, some areas here pop out, like Suffolk County, New York is an area that has uh, a, a high amount of, of ozone days and an increase in those ozone days moving into the future. Uh, however, the, the story around ozone really pales in comparison to the story around PM25 and wildfire smoke. If you remember back to the last map, the highest levels were in the West. These increases then would be on those lower levels that we're already seeing in these regions. In the West, in places where we've already seen really high levels of exposure, we're, we're, we're seeing that there, there, there's even more of an increase in these areas. And a lot of areas start to pop out in kind of the Northwest, uh, areas around Seattle pop out, uh, areas around Portland, uh, Northern California, even Southern California pops out. Uh, one thing that's sort of interesting to point out uh, here is that the, this area in the Central Valley, really due to the topography of the area, the fact that there are mountains on both sides, when smoke gets into the area, it's hard to get the smoke out of the area, but it's also an area that has a, has a high level of co-contamination with ozone. So unlike a lot of the rest of the country where we generally see either you have high ozone exposure or high PM 2.5 exposure, the California Central Valley is really exposed to both. And in fact, some of the highest exposure to ozone in the country is in the Southern part of the state in the Central Valley region. If we're looking at the areas with the highest increases or the largest increases in these poor air quality days or these orange plus days over the next 30 years, uh, some places start to pop out in some of these ma major metropolitan areas. Again, you can see Pierce County right outside of Seattle at the top of our list. Over the next 30 years, we're expecting to see almost two more weeks of uh, poor air quality days. Uh, and, you know, it, it, 12 days doesn't sound like a lot. We were thinking about 12 more days of being trapped in your house, not being able to go outside, worrying about 
the health consequences of being exposed to uh, to the poor air quality. That's two more weeks out of only 52 weeks that that these the, the people that live in in this county and in this area are going to have to be exposed to uh, to poor air quality. Again, Fresno pops out here about 90 days uh, uh, over the next uh, or in 2054, an eight day increase over that time period to Lowry County again, about a seven day increase up to 90 days. But again, we're only focused on the, the areas that have 100,000 properties or more uh, uh, in the area. So again, there are places that are smaller, uh, more rural areas that are that are seeing increases either equivalent to this or a little bit higher to this. Across the board, um, you know, Tulare County, Fresno County kind of show up as places that that have the most severe exposure to this poor air quality, regardless of whether we put the 100,000 property condition on the model or not. Um, and then just to, just to make the, the point that it's not just orange plus days, but there's a lot of exposure to what we would think of as, as the most severe or the worst air quality days. Those days are unhealthy days on the AQI index or what we would refer to as red days, very unhealthy days or what we would refer to as purple days, and then hazardous days or what we would refer to as maroon days. And when we take the actual population in the counties that are exposed at least to one day hitting a threshold uh, that is equivalent to a red day, a purple day, a maroon day, we can see the increase and the exposure in terms of area. Today, about 212 counties uh, uh, can expect to see at least one red day, increasing by about 50% over the next 30 years to 317 counties. Uh, about 51 counties can expect to see purple days in the current environment, increasing to about 69 counties over the next 30 years, a 35% increase. And today, only about nine counties uh, are expected to see hazardous days, but these are the areas that are going to have the most persistent, most severe exposure to uh, poor air quality days. And they're the places you'll see on the next map uh, that are, that are going to have the most severe consequences associated with that. That's expected to increase by about 22% over, over the next 30 years. Taking another approach, if we think about the population exposed, it, it's really interesting to think about the fact that we're only hitting about 7% of counties across the country, but that makes up about 25% of the population across the country. So these severe uh, exposure to the, the worst of the worst air quality days are happening disproportionately in places that, that are population centers, places that have already had some, some level of kind of anthropogenic pollution that, that is coming from the fact that there are automobiles in the area and industry in the area and economic activity in the area. But then that's interacting with climate to produce even more exposure. And we're starting to see, again, that disproportionately happen in areas, urban areas where there are large population centers, uh, as evidenced by the fact that about 83 million people are exposed to a, a red day today. About 83 million people live in these 212 counties. If we hold the population constant for uh, uh, today, 2024, and we project just the climate increase in exposure, the 2054 uh, uh, exposure to poor air quality would affect about 125 million people today. So if we take that, the future environment, uh, uh, applied it to the current population distribution, we're talking about a 51% increase in the exposure to an unhealthy red day into the future. A 13% increase in a purple day, going from about 9.9 .9 million to about 11.2 million under future climate conditions. And about a 27% increase, going from about a million and a half people exposed to hazardous days today, increasing to about 1.9 million, almost 2 million people uh, uh, given the future climate conditions. Uh, and, and the best way to think about this at least the best way I've been conveying this to, to people that we've been presenting this information out to, is that if you think about what this means for the future, you have to sort of think backwards. What, what's happened since we've improved air quality, given all the regulatory uh, improvements and, and policies that we put into place? Uh, well, since we've implemented the Clean Air Act, it's been estimated that we've prevented about a quarter of a million premature deaths. It's been estimated we've prevented nearly 200 heart attacks. We prevented the loss of about 17 million working days annually, and we prevented children from the loss of about 5.4 million school days. So this sort of covers the gamut of health consequences, economic productivity consequences, 
and more quality of life, kind of recreational uh, consequences associated with loss or uh, lost uh, 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 ability to sort of engage in these different activities. Um, so as we think about projecting into the future, we're essentially adding back more premature deaths. We're adding more heart attacks. We're adding more lost economic activity and lost labor days. Uh, and we're, we're, we're adding lost recreational uh, um, and quality of life metrics associated with even, even kids being able to go to school and, and uh, in the near future. Um, and finally, and then we'll, we'll hand it over for a quick demo. If, we want, if we're interested in, in sort of where this is happening, where the worst of the worst case is happening, again, it really pops out as a Western story. And as you start to think about where the worst, uh, where's the, the biggest increase in the worst uh, exposure to air quality, it really starts to become a Northwest uh, story. So again, we're, we're seeing that the highest number of red days, purple days, uh, maroon days, again, Fresno, Tulare County, the Central Valley, those areas really have the highest levels of exposure uh, into the future. Uh, you, you can see here, uh, uh, even tracked here on the very unhealthy days, about 35 days in, in Fresno County. Uh, but then you can see the increases of hazardous days in the area where, where we're starting to see as many as three more hazardous days. And those hazardous days are the ones that have you know, the, the biggest impact on, on, on health consequences. But now that's starting to migrate a little bit in terms of the, the, the exposure towards the, north, towards the Northwest. So we're starting to see Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, areas where we're also seeing an increased frequency and intensity associated with uh, wildfires become uh, kind of ground zero for increases in this, in this exposure to, to air pollution. Um, and I'll, I'll hand it over now to uh, to Matt, who will talk a little bit about the integration into our risk factor tool, and then I'll walk through a demo. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, so uh, while we produce all of this amazing data and the the great team with uh, at First Street from our uh, scientists to our data scientists to uh, everyone in between um, brings it all together so we can actually understand what's happening and communicate these things in reports. We also have a whole product team and engineering team that creates risk factors. So a product from, from First Street that allows you as an individual to also understand what is happening uh, at a property level. So what I'll go through now is risk factor itself, which is the new integration of air factor. So previously we have launched flood factor, uh, fire factor, wind factor, uh, and uh, heat factor. And so the fifth peril that we're adding now is air factor, as you probably guessed. So Jeremy, if you wouldn't mind, I'll take over the screen here and I will bring us into a risk factor demo. So uh, as you can see on the, the homepage here um, with risk factor, you can type in any address. I have one pre-populated to show kind of the the worst side of air quality, just so you can see all of the features within it. But you can literally put in any address, zip code, county, and get that level of information um, for um, the geography that you've chosen. And so what I have here is the first property um, that I'm, I'm bringing up. We have the general scores that are representative of a 30 year period. So air quality over the period of a mortgage, wildfire risk over the period of a mortgage, so on and so forth. Uh, and then general key insights about the property that are the most important things to look at. And so you can just tell from the scores here, there is some flood risk, there's some wildfire risk, there isn't hurricane wind risk, but you know, air factor or air quality is definitely the highest risk. So I'll just skip down to this because air quality is what we're talking about today. But you have access to the same type of information for all of those perils at a property level, um, uh, just like we have for fire and flood, but for, for air quality now. So this is the most extreme type of scenario that we have for uh, an air factor. So we have a 10 out of 10. And as you can see, over the next 30 years, for a bad year, we would expect 47 days uh, at an air quality 
that exceeds 100 on the AQI index that Jeremy was talking about earlier. So Dr. Porter went through a number of AQI scenarios. This means it will either be at or above that level. And then it's going to increase, given the climate components, over the next 30 years by 25.5%. So a quick graph at the bottom of what you can expect in a bad year during this kind of period that you might be living in this property to really give you an insight as to what this would be like to, to live in this area. We have a small call out here of what can happen from that AQI quality, but then we have a number of sections related to air quality. So we have the history, we have a rating, maps and polluting facilities, air quality drivers, indoor air quality uh, calculators, and then solutions. I'll run through all of these so you can have a good understanding of what's available for every property in the country. So from a history perspective, when you open this up, you will get the historic max AQI and the actual date that it was observed in that year. So for 2014, the max AQI for this property was observed on January 3rd and it was an AQI of 166. Underneath, you have the average AQI for that given year. So on average, the AQI was 56, uh, and the worst day in that year was 166. So you can kind of track along here to understand um, the different years and whether they were better or worse than other years in the past. The other thing that we also have is the combined um, air quality days of poor air qualities. So you saw the graph at the beginning, what we would expect in a bad year was 47, I believe. Well, we're seeing that historically in bad years, that's about where we're at and how that'll change over time. So you have that same type of graph that you had above, but given the cumulative days at that rating. The next section you can open up in, in what are called these accordions, which is a fun name, um, is the air quality rating. So the EPA, um, has uh, attainment standards. And so these standards are set uh, nationally uh, so that you know if pollution levels are safe um, for people in that area. And so what you can see in this high risk area, this 10 out of 10 extreme air factor area, that it doesn't actually meet the EPA standards. So for smoke, PM25, um, that wildfire smoke that we were talking about, it doesn't meet the standard. And for ozone, um, or what's also known as smog, uh, it doesn't meet the standards as well. So in general, this is a poor air quality area and it's known to be a poor air quality area from the EPA. You can also then look at air quality rankings. So how am I relative to, at this property, relative to the city, relative to the state? And so you can see for this property, it's 47 days. It is relative to the city, on average, that city overall is seeing this across the board. So you're not seeing big variants within the city, but in comparison to the state, it's all, it's more than double um, what you would expect to see across properties uh, in that state. So then the big question is, well, where would a good air quality area be and where would a poor air quality be? So exactly what we're serving up here, serving up here where you can see that the cities in California with the best air quality are Big River and Imperial Beach and Needles. You can click through to any of these to see the details. And unfortunately, on the other side of the scale, we have the cities in California with the worst air quality that we would expect. So San Jose, Sacramento, Fresno. And Fresno was one of the ones that was highlighted throughout the report, given its impact from, from air quality. And so the next accordion section that we have as well is these uh, the air quality maps themselves and polluting facilities. So are these things called toxic release inventory, the TRI program um, that the EPA has, which is uh, manufacturers um, that are, or industrial facilities that are releasing chemicals in the air. So what you can see given your actual uh, building location is whether there's nearby TRI facilities. So if we view this map, we can see two different things within the map platform. One is, where is my property? And then the number of AQI days we would forecast in a bad year over 100. And you can see that this year, the best way to look at this is this year, days with air quality index above 100. Or you can change this to days with an air quality index above 150. So a, a higher threshold. And then you can see visually on the map where we would expect those changes to be. So you can see in the area 
where we'd expect better air quality or poor air quality. So these little facilities next to where I see the pin for my property is a TRI site. And so I'm able to actually click on this and see what the facility is. And I can also click through to the EPA site, which will give me the exact details of what that facility is, the type of chemicals that it is producing, um, whether it's in, a, in compliance or not, phone numbers, et cetera. So it really brings that information front and center for you to allow you to know what might be nearby or, or might not be. And you can click on any of these and get that information. The other important part that we talk about with climate and changing these things is that you can then see what happens in 15 years. So what does the map look like in 15 years? What does the map look like in 30 years? And so you can change this between the different levels, as you saw before, going from 47 to 59. Uh, and then we just give some general information on here and written information about the, the property has within 30 miles of it, two of these facilities. And both of those facilities are in the highest 25% of the EPA's TRI inventory program. So important things to know if you are living at this location. So if I go back to the, uh, the Air Factor report, um, we've gone through a number of the sections now, um, but the uh, the next three, the air quality drivers, as you talked about, Jeremy, uh, Dr. Porter, and Dr. Kearns talked about throughout the the overall presentation, there are three different kind of components we look at. There's PM25 that's driven by human activities or anthropogenic activities, as it's called. There's PM25 being driven by wildfire smoke that we measure and forecast, and then there is uh, O3 or ozone that is being measured as, as poor air quality that drives that AQI index. So we have that broken down where you can see the anthropogenic or the human activities is held constant here. But then the real driver in this area is wildfire smoke, um, driving those, um, those graphs up in 15 years and 30 years, and a smaller contribution, but still a, a contribution on the increase from ozone levels from 10 to 12 to 14. And then a little breakdown on PM25 from wildfire smoke and what that means and the health concerns associated with it, ozone and what that means, and then the, the human activities or the anthropogenic 2.5, what causes that and what that means. All of these drive to learn more articles that we have. And then lastly, I know there was a couple of questions about this in the, in the um, uh, Q&A uh, sections, but how does air quality actually impact you if you're indoors. So a lot of times when there's poor air quality, we are told to stay inside. We are told not to go to work or do outside uh, labor or go to school. But what is our indoor air quality when the outdoor air quality is poor? That's exactly what we're, we're looking to answer here for you. So with every property, whether it's with our flood model or wildfire model, all of them we take into consideration the property characteristics. So if you edit property details, was there a residential building, when it was built, the square footage, so on and so forth, that's all taken into, into account. And then the important thing here is we have, well, what is the outdoor air quality? What would the associated indoor air quality then be? So if I don't have a filter, I don't have an air purifier, I don't have upgraded insulation, there's no protection. You are going to have the same indoor air quality that you have outdoor. But if I actually add something, so a MERV-6 or a MERV-8, you may have heard these terms before, or a HEPA filter at the, the other end of it, these are all protective standards that can help you. So if you do have central air in your house or central heating, and you add in a MERV-6 filter, when that's running, when you have poor air quality outside, you can see the change when I hit calculate on what that means and translates to for indoor air quality. You can also add things like an air purifier. This is an, an, a big solution that is being told all the time when there is poor air quality to run an air purifier. So if we have a MERV-6 filter and an air purifier, what does that do for indoor air quality? You can see these things dropping dramatically. And even though it's unhealthy outside, we're now in a very good range inside. Or if you upgrade the insulation to your home, so you have better insulation, it even drives further. So all of these things are, are available as solutions and for you to understand, given the forecast outside, how can I actually protect myself inside? And then lastly, we just have a number of, of solutions for you to go through. So you can look at air filters like I was just talking about. You can look at air purifiers and you can look at upgrading your insulation. What do those look like? What is the cost? The good news story here is that 
you know, air purifiers and air filters, if you have central air, are relatively cheap and have a big impact on the air quality inside your home. So it's great for us uh, to use that as a solution. So that is the air factor section within risk factor. Um, and those are all of the tools and functionality that we have available for every property in the country. So like I said at the beginning, go to riskfactor.com, type in whatever address you're interested in, and that data is available for you. Um, so you may have another question then, which is, well, that's great for individual properties, but I would really like to access the data in a, a broader format. Um, so what do we have available for that? Uh, luckily, we have multiple ways for you to access the data. And so it's not just about risk factor itself that gives you access to any residential or commercial building in a one-by-one -one format. We also have all of our data, so flood, wildfire, extreme heat, hurricane winds, and now air quality available in three different formats for uh, commercial users outside of the risk factor tool. So whether that's bulk data that you're looking for, so every property for the entire country in one big file, we have lots of federal customers and top banks and institutional investors and things like that that leverage our data that way. We can also cut it to the state level if there's just an individual state that you're interested in or at a local geography, at a city level or a county level or something like that. So our data is available through bulk, through any geographic level. We are also able to do custom pulls. So what does your portfolio look like? If you have 100 facilities, 10 facilities, or even up to you know 10 million, 14 million properties, we have done portfolio matching to that level before, and we can deliver that. So you just provide us with addresses or lat longs, and then we can give that data back to you for the properties that you actually care about to answer things like regulatory um, compliance issues or understand portfolio risk and how to optimize uh, your portfolio against these levels of risk. And then lastly, we have API access. So every single one of our data points is available in our API that we can make available, including those map layers that you saw in, in risk factor. So uh, this is great for our partners like redfin.com that launched this air quality with us or realtor.com that has our data integrated uh, or homes.com. So all of these different great places that you can actually access our data outside of, of the risk factor tool where we add on our data to give a better user experience for, for folks on different websites or different apps. So these are all data access points that are available to you. If you're interested, please reach out to us at uh, bd at firststreet.org. That stands for business development. Uh, and we'd be happy to, to talk to you about that. Um, so with that, um, I see that we are, are right at time. Uh, and we thank you for joining the webinar. I know there are still a number of outstanding questions because I can see the big little red uh, Q&A icon box with a number of questions that are, are still outstanding to be answered. We will do our best to, to answer those questions. This will be recorded or has been recorded, I should say, and we will send this out um, to anyone that signed up for the webinar uh, and anyone that's on our mailing list as a recording that you can access later as well. So thank you so much for your time today, for your interest. Uh, we will continue to do these series uh, into the future. And uh, we look forward to hearing any of your questions that you may have or, or hearing about any inquiries uh, about our data so that we can find a way to partner with you in the future. So I thank Dr. Kearns, I thank Dr. Porter, and we look forward to the next webinar with all of you. Have a great day and happy Valentine's Day.